from the Holy Spirit um, tonight. I trust that even as he has called this meeting and he is drawing each one that he wants to be here, that um, the Holy Spirit will speak to each heart and minister directly into each heart, that everyone would hear and learn and receive that which the Spirit has for us. Um, before we go ahead, or well, as we go ahead, shall I say, Sister Maureen is going to lead us in a, in a short time of worship. Are you available, sis? Can you, is your network here yes, with us? I'm here, sis. Awesome. Over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. We adore you, Lord. We adore you. Your name be exalted in the heavens, exalted in the earth. Hallelujah. Your name. Is exalted in the heavens, Jesus. Exalted in the earth, Father, we worship you. Hallelujah. Your name is exalted in the heavens. It's all in the earth. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Ramosi candele ababadianda. Your name is the Alpha and Omega. Remeka sata yandoriaba. Beginning and the end. That's why we worship. Hallelujah. Your name is exalted in the heavens, exalted in the earth. We honor you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. Hallelujah. We glorify your holy name, bowing before your throne. We magnify your holy name, excellent one, bowing before your throne. We bless your name. Arada Sakataya, Almighty God, bowing before your throne, Yamasukaraya Masataya. We glorify your holy name. We bow before your throne. Your name is as altered in the heavens. Rakusatayana is a the We want to honor you. We want to worship you. Hallelujah. Let your glory be above all the earth. Is atmosphere, Lord. Let your glory be upon all the earth. So be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Be thou exalted, O God, on everyone here, Lord. Let your glory be above all the earth. Let your glory be above all the earth. Let your glory be upon Oh, dear. We honor you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. 
at your precious love that your glory be above all oh, hallelujah God bless you sir. God bless you sir. thank you so much thank you Thank you, sisters. Once again, welcome to Marriage School this evening. It's such an honor and a privilege to be here. All right, so we are going to, um, when we closed last week, I don't know if um, you remember, but we, as we were closing the session last week, Sister Frimpoma discovered a, a, a question that she had overlooked, and we promised that we would start this session this week with that question. So if you would give me a moment, I want to pull that question back up so that, ah, here we go, so that we can answer it. And the question is, hey, question has gone, okay, no question is back. Uh, uh, question is, is there a chance that God doesn't want one to have children? Um, sisters, anyone would would anyone like to um handle that particular question? Is there a chance that God doesn't want someone to have children? Is there a chance that perhaps somebody, you know? It's just destined by God for that person to never have children. Any thoughts? Hey, the silence in this room is so beautiful. All right. Um. I will give a perspective on it and I would welcome someone else to contribute or to offer their perspective as well, please. Um, yes, please. Yes. Was yes, oh, there please. a hand up? Yes, yes, yes. yes Samuel, go ahead. Go ahead. Please. So I want to share. Good evening, sisters, and um, we thank God for yet another. Tuesday. So I want to share the scripture um, from Matthew chapter 19, verse 12. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some, um, where am I? Oh, which were made eunuchs of men. And there, oh, wait, once again, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there be Enoch's which have made themselves Enoch's for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Now, this is one aspect of the will of God for some people. The Bible says that there are some Enoch's which were born so. Now, the Bible makes us understand that he has a blueprint of a plan for each and every one of us. Sorry, sister. So he has a blueprint for each and every one of us. And he said that he called some to be apostles. He called some to be teachers. You know, he has given us different purposes in life. Now, one thing I realized is that when the Lord says that I have plans for you, plans of good and not of evil, we only look at the ones, the the, the good in the plan that would benefit our, ourselves and how we look at good from our perspective. Now, the Bible also talks about the fact that we should increase and multiply. So then the argument is that, Father, if you want me to be able to increase and you want me to be able to multiply, then why would I be without a child? Because in our perspective, increment and multiplication comes only in the prolification of our kind. But we also see Jesus cursing the fig tree because it was not bearing fruit. So we understand that. Literally, the fig tree had to bear a fruit after their own kind, which is a fig that had to come forth on that fruit. 
We understand that the fig does not eat itself, but the fig is supposed to be eaten by man. So we see here that the fruitfulness really was not to the benefit of the, of the tree, but fruitfulness to the purpose for which it was created, to be eaten by man. There's a reason why the Lord says that I have called you by name. Why you are Sister Corrie, why I am Mona, why everybody is the way they are, why you have hair, why you don't have hair, why you are fair, why you are dark, why you have beautiful eyes, why somebody else will say they have green or blue. I mean, look at God's creation. It's so diverse and so is the diversity of his plans for his children. Now, we find ourselves in a world where everything can be fast-tracked, everything can be skewed to fit the desires that we want. For instance, I mean, you don't have hair, there are weave ones. You want thick lashes, you can, you know, go get yourself lashes like a fan. How long, I mean, it doesn't matter how long you want it to be. Nobody's going to tell you it should be short or it should be a setting. You know, you can have, if you want long nails, you can have nails as long as you want. You know, everything is, 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 is on the table for sale. And these days we, we hear of the cosmetic surgery where if you don't have boobs, you can go get boobs. You want hips, big hips, big butt, big everything. It's, it's available. You want flat tummy, it's available. But in all these, we see the provision of man in the intervention of creation. Hallelujah. At what point does man stop at altering God's purpose and God's creation? These knowledge we're giving so that certain people who would you know, encounter accidents and be deformed in one way or the other, you know, be able to be restored. But we realize that because of the desires of man and because man right from creation has stood in contention, you know, with God's plan starting from Lucifer, we see the same thing trickling down in our world today because God's provision is not enough. I'm not saying that the knowledge of cosmetic surgery is bad. I'm not saying that all the things that, but we realize that these provisions are so fast-tracked and so available to us to an extent where we begin to play God and we begin to feel that we have a right to contend with certain decisions that God has made concerning our lives. Is it possible that some are called to be eunuchs? How much of God's plan do we want to accept as part of our lives? Has anybody who has no children been able to make an impact in this world? I want us to cast our minds to the achievement of Mother Teresa. Did she make an impact? Was she able to be a mother to many? Did she alter the lives of many? Is her name still remembered even in our times? I mean, she's not in the Bible. She's not one of the disciples, you know, written in the Bible, but she was a disciple of our time and a disciple of God. What do we remember or what comes into mind when we, we call her name? How many of us on this platform have children who have been able to achieve what somebody like Mother Teresa has been able to achieve? Now, I'm drawing our attention to the fact that it is only when we walk in the purpose of God, no matter how bitter the pill may be, because he says that if it is your, you know, if it's left to me alone, let this cup pass me by, but not my will, but according to your will. So there comes a point in our lives where we get to swallow that bitter pill because the Lord wants us to be taught a particular lesson, to be an example to someone just like the fig tree. You do not produce the fruits only to be eaten by yourself. So when we consider the array of promises that the Lord has for us as children of God and which most preachers, you know, um, and base, you know, prosperity preaching and um, entitlement preaching on. And because of that, our knowledge of the blessings of God has been skewed towards um, a setting um, outcome that would supposedly, you know, let people also see that, you know, the Lord has blessed us. When you talk of wealth, where was Paul? The wealth, the way we understand wealth today, when we talk of wealth, where was Paul? Where was Peter? Where was Timothy? Where were all the disciples? Did they have mansions? So you realize that the things that we look at, blessings and prolification and multiplication and increase and progress, all these things have been skewed by the expectations of this world so that we begin to align those expectations with God's blessings. Now, at what point did Elon Musk become rich? At what point did Bill Gates become Bill Gates? 
What did these people do to, to warrant the wealth that they have? I want us to understand that, you know, there is a cycle that human beings have instituted where you grow up, you go to school. If you don't go to school, it means you are a failure. At a point as a woman in your life, you ought to get married. When you don't get married and you cross that, oh, your time is almost over. Stress begins to build up. And after you get married and there are no kids, you know, that's another hurdle to cross. Uh, when your husband gets sick, it's another hurdle to cross. When your career doesn't, you know, take off, it's another hurdle to cross. At what point does it stop? And which one of these challenges are weightier than the others? How do we see these things that come into our way? Because you see, it's a consistent walk with God and a consistent tra travel with him. But he says that here do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, hallelujah, because he knows that these challenges will come our way. And he understands that you will go through these things. And he understands that certain things are peculiar only to you because of your name. So when the Lord says that he has written your name in the palms of his hand, we are happy because, oh God, you cannot forget about me. Your blessings and all your goodness, you know, I stand to enjoy a sense of entitlement, which is good because you're a child of, of the most high God. But at what point does it stop? At what point do we allow him to father us? At what point do we completely trust that his plan is the best and not ours? Maybe you are saying that, oh, you can talk the way you are talking because you have children. Yes, I have children. It's my name in the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, other people's names who have never had children in there, yes. What I'm trying to say here is the fact that anything outside God's purpose will not land us into the expected end. You see, it's not about ticking the boxes of achievement or the boxes of the cycle that we are supposed to go on. Hallelujah. And so these days you realize that even people who are not married yet to have children and then they go and do sperm bank and then, you know, get themselves pregnant and have a child. Now, I want you to look at this picture. Did anybody deprive you of a father? Maybe there are some who for one reason or the other had to live with our fathers. But was it a conscious decision by our mothers for us not to have fathers and therefore they chose a sperm bank? Now, what qualifies us to be good mothers by depriving the child that we are bringing into this world of a father? What qualifies us to be good parents by deciding for this child who is coming to, to this world to be an individual, that you cannot have a father because I had to take a box to be a mother, hallelujah. How does your desire to, to be a mother impact on the life of this child? For everything that we have known and for the father that we can cry to as our father in heaven, how does this relationship begin to affect and impact on the life of this child who is coming into this world as an individual because we decide to play God? Must this child grow up testing every person he enters a relationship with or every woman, every man they enter a relationship with because this child could be their, their, their sibling? Is that the kind of future we want to give our children? For whatever reason, the Lord is giving us the state that we are in is between us and our father and we ought to trust him. Nobody is born, is not, we are not all born to be doctors. We are not all born to be Bill Gates. We are not all born, I mean, to have the same lifestyle that is expected to be that which the world expects, you know, to be the best. And yet we yearn and we crave towards these things. And we forget that at the end of the day, it will not be about the number of children that you had or about the kind of husband, whether thick, tall, short, blonde, you know, that would, would, would earn you the gates or the rights to enter heaven. Because the more responsibility the Lord gives us, remember that the more accountability you have to make. When the Lord will give you children, remember that you have an accountability towards that. And because our father loves us and because he knit us from within and because he knows the kind of abilities he has put in us, we ought to trust him. In good times and in bad times, we ought to trust him. We cannot select what seemingly look good in the array of blessings of God and term it as good and term everything else as bad. Because that is not the expectations we have of God's goodness. But he never said that he will leave you. He never said that he will forsake any of us. So in this area too, we need to trust God. When God has called us to be Enoch's, when God has called us, you know, to, to, to not have our own biological children, and we would begin to ask, Father, what would you have me do with this situation? We keep running from him, and yet we want to know him. We want to, him to use us. This is also one of the aspects, you know. And interestingly, Father does not weigh one challenge more than the other. 
So at that point, when he himself would deprive and deny himself of being the protective father by letting go of his son, you know, how do we go through that now? How do we put that forth as a sacrifice from us? And considering the life of Christ himself, his purpose he knew was to come into this world to die and yet he came. So if it is ours not to, you know, have 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 a wife, have a husband, have have a child, uh, to serve God and not ever build a career. At what point are we going to say that this is this is the cup that you have given me and I will drink of it? Because he said that open your mouth your mouth wide and I will fill it. And he's filling it with good good things. Lift up your cup. I mean, it's something that we sing all the time. You know that Lord, you will fill it. What what do we want God to fill it with? With His goodness. Is it the goodness we see in our eyes, or the goodness that the Lord understands and and knows that we need as His children? Which one do we do we do we do we choose? Are we trusting Father fully? Sisters, it's a walk of trust. It's a walk of letting go because he says that you cannot put your hand to the plow and look back and begin to tell father that, you know, this sacrifice I cannot make because this is what I want. And there are times that, you know, people get married and then the next day their husbands have accidents and they break their waist and that presupposes that they can never have children. And so in those instances, what would you do? You may say that this is not what is happening in your case. You have a husband. And so why has God allowed you to have a husband? Have you asked father what to do with the situation? For those of us who have children already, there are many other challenges that we face. So you see, before God and before who we trust as our father, he does not favor others over, over others. In fact, he treats us equally. And, and as I talk, we are all on a journey. Your husband is on a journey. You are on a journey. At what point do you accept that, Father, I really want all of you and less of me? You know, at what point do we understand that whatever you'd have me do, Lord, it is well with my soul? At what point? Because you see, there are a lot of us with so much anger in our hearts because of what we are contending in our marriages. There are some with so much pain. There are some who feel that they are locked up in boxes because this whole thing feels like a prison and I cannot break free. I made the wrong decision and therefore, Lord, you know, can we restart? Can we reset? But you see, when you read Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Sister Kerido, can you please project that for me? Um, Philippians chapter 2. Okay, no, I'm not there yet. Take Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, please. Okay. Are you able to project it for us? Okay. Let's see. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Thinking of others as better than yourself. In the choices that we make, you see, is there pride? Is there self? Is there a desire to be like everybody else, comparing ourselves to other people? And for that reason, we cannot accept the purpose that father has given us to fulfill on this earth. Are we really thinking that without a child, you know, we can never live a fulfilled life? Is that what we are thinking? And then when you read Colossians chapter three, I just want to go there very quickly. Yes, Colossians chapter three. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then I jump to the verse five. He says that put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly natural, uh, your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. And because of these, the wrath of God is coming. It says that you used to walk in these, in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself. So after the things that are, you know, related to idolatry is not enough. The debris, he said that, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. 
Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is all in all. Hallelujah. So we realize that when the people of Babylon came together and they wanted to build was it Babylonians? Yeah, they wanted to build the Tower of Babel. The Lord sat up and he watched them. You see, there's no way that we can play God in any circumstance that we find ourselves. Father will stop us because that is not what we have been called to do. That's not the purpose for which he created us. And Lucifer tried that and it didn't work. So we anything that gives us an opportunity or offers us a chance to play God, we have to be careful. For there is a way that may seem right unto man, but the Bible says the end thereof is death. So these are just few things that um, I want us to think about in the area of giving up our will, our desires, because you see, nobody has ever made it who has no, not ever sacrificed. Everything that would lead us to greatness calls for a sacrifice. And for most of us, we spend years and years of our lives trying to, you know, acquire a degree. In fact, each and every one of us have spent almost, you know, close to 20 years building, you know, career, building and acquiring knowledge. It's a sacrifice. Each and every one of us have had to make an input into something that we may be enjoying today that you had made a sacrifice for years back. So there's nothing that can be achieved, really without a sacrifice, any other thing that offers a shortcut. And I was sharing earlier on with a sister in the day that when I used to struggle, you know, when I used to struggle with submitting to a particular thing that my husband was de desiring of me, you know, not to do. And I struggled and I fought and I struggled and I fought. You see, by the time we were doing the, the, the Eden fast, that was when the Holy Spirit began ministering to me. That you see, a lot of the things that we desire to do is because we ourselves have no desire to forfeit anything, but we want to yet expect to get the outcome. Now, in my case, I thought I wanted to eat everything. I want to be able to eat everything and at the same time be able to keep fit and at the same time be able to keep to a certain weight. And so I'll eat everything I want. And then I'll burn it at the end of the day. I'll walk 20 kilometers a day, you know, making sure that I burn all the junk that I have eaten. Now, I thought that that was the best way. Now, what I was actually doing was that depriving my body of the nourishment of food. Because when you eat junk, your body is not being nourished. You maintain the weight, you know, because you are working out, you will lose it all. But what is your body really getting from all the things that you are feeding it with? And I didn't look at it that way. So I would, his intervention for me not to do the 20 kilometers and work out like, you know, crazy was something that I contended with because I thought that he was doing me wrong. Now, what the Holy Spirit taught me was that it was because I was not willing to deny myself and subject myself to eating right. And therefore, I refused to see the fault in my life and saw everything wrong with what he was telling me, you know, not to do. And many of us find ourselves in those situations because everything else is about somebody else. We, you know, they are making us do these things. They are forcing us to do these things. They are making me angry. They are making me upset. They are causing me to be bitter because he did this or that, you know, I, I, I want to do this and I don't see anything wrong with it. And, but if we really sit down, is it out of a selfish desire that you really want to have that child? What is it for? Because everything that we have is for God's use. And so if, our desire is not even for that, you know, then what is it? Is it to satisfy? Is it to tick a box? Is what I'm asking here. 
And until the Lord opened my eyes, I, I would always blame people around me for all my faults, for all my mistakes, because I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, I'm always misright, you know, like I, I, I think through things, you know, I just don't come up with things and just get up and do things. And therefore, if you are telling me I can't do this, then it means that it's your fault that now I'm gaining weight. It's your fault that, you know, I have pains all over my body because when I was working out, I was fine. I was healthier, really. Because in the end, it would have banged in on my health because I was overworking my body and not nourishing it the way it ought to be nourished. So sisters, food for thought. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will work on all of us. Hallelujah. God bless you, sis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we have another hand up. Mama B, are you um, ready and available, please? Yes, sis. Um, good evening, sisters. Good evening, sis. Um, that Mona, God bless you so much for the, the word you've shared. And I, I just want to share a testimony Uncle Abel White shared when he came to preach in our church last, last year. And it brought my mind to so many things that we as Christians, we do. And there's a scripture he shared, uh, Proverbs 14, verse 1. That's what he, he preached, he used to preach, Proverbs 14, 1. And I read, I'll uh, read the first part and skip to the last part. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And I skip to the last portion. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there is any who understand. Any who seek God. And what I learned from his preaching and his testimony, he shared the testimony of himself and his wife. And he said, um, when they got married, they tried and tried and tried. They did not have kids. So they don't have children. But later on in life, God made them understand the ministry he had put in their way. And be, 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 even though they do not have children of their own, they have gained so many children all around the world. That is even overwhelming. And people, they, they basically help people. They, they, they take care of people and all that. And it brought to mind that the reason why he shared this scripture was that, you know, when we hear, we will we'll think that, well, I'm not a fool. I don't say there's no good, but sometimes, the position of our heart. Are we going to say that because uh, you don't, we do not have a child, or you don't have this, or that God is not real? Sometimes we Christian will look at the scripture that says that there shall be no barren in the in, in the land, and we run with it. But as Sister Mona said, are we walking in the purpose of God? God never makes a mistake. God never. Uh, 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 gets confused everybody has a purpose for which they have been sent onto the earth but we allow ourselves to be uh, battered by the pressures of this world the pressures of society yes you get at a certain age you have to get married if you are not married there's an issue we are panicking okay finally we get married and after the marriage another pressure comes up when are you having children when are the children come and they just mount a lot of pressure on people? What I be, have come to believe is that God has a purpose for everybody. So I, I will buttress on what someone has said. It is better to uh, be in touch with God and find out if that is your purpose. If it is your purpose to be a parent, he will make it happen. But what if you don't become a parent? Does it mean God does not exist? Yes, he does, and he is a good God. So it will be better to walk in the purpose of God than to look at societal pressures and uh, uh, take a box like, yeah, I made it, I got married. Yes, I have a good job. Yes, I have ch children. There are some people who end up having children, and the children, instead of becoming a blessing, become a headache. But the Bible made, made us know that children are a heritage from God. So if we are doing all sorts of things, we are every every uh, uh, medicine we want to take, 
we prayed about this person we are going to visit we tried all our best everything humanly possible and it's still not coming doesn't mean god doesn't exist he is god so i would encourage that um we will we, we'll seek god and find out the purpose of our lives maybe you're not supposed to have your own children but god is going to use you just like uncle Lebo white and his wife to touch so many lives to look after so many people he will bless you to look after so many children bless you to uh, uh, care for people's children and that is where your purpose lies so it is better to for us to pray and focus on the purpose god has for us rather than uh, getting so fixated for want of a better word on trying to take a box or because this person has, I also need to have some. Otherwise, it doesn't make me a woman. Otherwise, it doesn't make me complete. Um, Uncle Bo's story really uh, uh, put us in check because sometimes we will not say it with our mouth, but in our heart, our actions, our demeanor, our utterances sometimes portrays that uh, God doesn't know what he's doing. As sister, sisters, I believe that we will be more at peace if we 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 have a talk with our father and we know we allow him to direct us on what to do that is where we find fulfillment it's not just trying to please society or take a book in a family and make us feel like yeah we got it. so this is a little i want to share uh, uh, with us thank you thank you so much mama b god bless you for your contribution I think we have examined all the possible angles for that particular question, and we thank God for granting us the wisdom. So we have a couple of questions here that um, we have been tasked with answering. Some of our sisters have shared, and I believe some of them are here listening for the responses. I'm going to, there's, there are two different questions, but I'm going to merge them because so well, these first in this first um, instance, I'm going to merge two questions um, that have to do with marriage and finance, please. So sister number one is asking and says that my husband is not happy with me paying tithes. What should I do? That's sister number one. And then sister number two has um she says that. Please, how do you deal with a husband who is earning more income than you and wants to do 50-50 with you, where you are not earning enough to do that, where you can hardly buy a dress for yourself for work? So we have two separate questions, but they're both um, in the area of finance. Um, I see Sister Mona is on mute. Do you want to help us, please, please? No, sis, not yet, please. <laughs> the same for us, Stephen Poma. Anybody? <clears throat> um, sis. Yes, please. Um, good evening, sisters. So <clears throat> let's take the, the tight question first. Um, so I think when I hear the question, the thing that the Holy Spirit whispers to me is, I mean, how did we get there? Because sometimes you want to address issues, you know, on the surface, like, oh, my husband says I shouldn't do this. And so please tell me what to do. Um, the reality is none of us can, <laughs> can say what you should do in a situation like this, but the Holy Spirit can help you. Um, and I'm led to say that um, most of the things that happen in marriage, they, they don't just happen, you know. They are a combination of things that have gone on. And, and so when it comes to the word of God, God doesn't like confusion in the home. And being one is the main theme of the Bible, being one with love. So God wants you to be one with your husband. Forget about, you know, you know the Bible says I should pay tithes and this and that. If you are not one with your husband and you are paying tithes, it still is not in alignment um, with how God wants you to live with your husband. So we cannot tell you whether you should pay your tithe or not. But what I can say is um, ask the Holy Spirit for help 
to resolve whatever led to this decision of don't pay tithes. Um, so have conversations with your, your father about this. Pray and ask God for guidance. God is a mediator. He's a counselor. Uh, he's a communicator. He's wise. He knows where your husband is coming from, but he also can tell you where this came from. And ideally, let's deal with that because otherwise after the tithe, there'll be something else. Now, it reminds me of my own situation. Um, when I was trying to have kids, when we we're trying to have kids, one day I was speaking to God and the Lord reminded me that, um, you know, or at least I felt the Lord telling me that I should go pay tithe or I should go tell my husband that he should go and pay tithe. And that's the, that's the issue, um, that he is not paying tithe. Um, and I should also be more faithful in my tithe paying. And I went to speak to my husband and he said, um, no. I mean, he, he, he was not convicted about that work. So he was not going to do anything. And I remember somersaulting all over the place. Oh my God, you're the reason why we are not having kids. Now I know this man doesn't have my welfare at his heart. Oh, blah, blah, blah. The bottom line is my husband didn't move. God gave us children. Um, but that didn't become an issue in that as well. It was an issue for some days. But afterwards, I think when I spoke to God, the Lord said that he never told me to go and tell my husband what to do. So if God tells you to pay tight, God wants us to be in alignment with our husbands. He will make sure that there is an alignment. So if that alignment is not coming, it is one of two things. Maybe you're not hearing well from God or there is something going on in terms of your submission to your husband. And the Lord cares more about that than the tithe. Mind you, it is not the tithe that you pay that the Lord needs to bless you. Because sometimes we get very stuck on the practices, but there is a doctrine behind the practice. And the doctrine is submit to your husband as unto the Lord. So you cannot bypass the husband and then get submission, submission to the Lord. So if the man some way, somehow says things that seem not to agree with what the word of God is telling you, it means that there is a submission that is off. So then the question is, Father, help me. What is going on here? What conversation should I have with my husband? Um, or what happened? What did I do? My experience with... Um, with people is that typically when somebody says, I don't want you to do that. It's not a thing they're telling you, they're forbidding you, that is the issue. There's something else. There's something beneath. So that's what you want God to resolve. So that'll be the first thing that I'll say. Um, the other thing about the 50-50 financial model, um, a lot of different financial models are used in, models are used in marriage. Um, I've seen some work better than the other. Um, at the end of the day, all of us, we came with nothing. All of us who live with nothing. God cares about the peace and the sanity of the family. So if your salary is not as much now, may I take, I, I use things to, you know, claim things for myself for the future. Um, the conversation that I'm, the thing that I'm wondering is, what are the expenses of the home? That's what matters. So if I need to contribute 50% of what I earn for the family to run, so this is, why is, that a, why is that a problem, you know? And I know you say, oh, I can't even buy a dress for myself. And I, I, I feel you, I understand you. But in this season, if that's the contribution that you need to make, do it and ask God to bless it. What we contribute is not everything that we have. Whatever we get is not just our salaries. God gives us resources. He gives us multiple streams of sources. Um, and so the salary alone is not the, the only source that you have. So I will go and ask God, okay, well, the man says I should give 500. If I give 500, it looks as if the 500 I have left, it doesn't do anything for me. So Father, open another stream for me. So let's get into a habit of, trusting God and speaking to God rather than looking at the things in front of us. Me, if I sit here, my husband 
says that I should bring a thousand, even though he knows that I have 800. I'll say, oh, and then God, where is the 200 coming from? God, help me. Bless me. Where is it coming from? I'm looking. I'm expectant. I'm willing to receive. Instead of going to fight. Hey, why do you say I should give you 1,000? I have only 800. That is the wisdom of the world. It is a limitation belief. It's a limiting belief. You, are, you, you feel as if all I have is this. I will never have more. And I'm being cheated. Who is cheating you? What is the money being used for? Isn't it your home? Isn't it your husband? Isn't it yourself? Isn't it your children? So why is it? A, why, why, why is, where is the problem? As I sit here, if God tells me, empty your account, because I want to use something for it. I don't know. It means God has a bigger plan for me. He definitely, is he not going to give me more? He will give me more. But he, God, feels that whatever I should empty my account into is what he wants to use, what is in my account to do now. So I think for us women, sometimes we can really have some limitations in the way we see what we see right now. We don't see feather. God sees what he sees right now. He sees feather. So in the relationship and even in the conversations we have with our husband, sometimes we miss an important thing that God is part of that conversation. God knows. God knew what your husband was about to tell you. God allowed it. And God says, submit. <laughs> you know, I actually just did a teaching on submission. God says, submit. If you're going to be in a Christian marriage, submission is the solution. There is nothing around it. All. It's not like, oh, if I were to be earning as much as he's earning, if he says I should bring 50%, I'll submit. Sweetheart, go and submit and then speak to God about it and say, God, this is what I have left. Help me, bless me, open, you know, open avenues for me. Open the floodgates of heaven for me. Let your abundance reach me too. Before you realize it, you are earning more than your husband. Now, sometimes some of the journeys that the Lord takes us through, it's a trial until we get to the other place. Because if you get to the place where you are earning more, we hear this all the time. In fact, the question normally comes from the other side. Oh, I am earning a lot more and my husband wants me to give almost a lot of what I'm earning. So my question to you is, when you get to that place where you are earning more, do you know what you will do? So the Lord is preparing you. So right now, the little that you are earning, give abundantly of it. Even if you need to give 80%, give and let it go. And commit it to God and ask God to teach you to multiply what you have in your hand. So our dependency has to be on God. So I will not care whether my husband is bringing two and I'm bringing 100. Or I'm bringing 80 and he's bringing 2,000. I don't care. What I care about is God multiplies it. Because I personally don't think what I earn is what takes me through life. I don't know. I mean, most of our sisters here. Whatever you earn, if you look at the life that the Lord is giving you, it doesn't match up. It doesn't. It doesn't add up. So there is something coming from somewhere that we don't know where it's coming from. So it is irrelevant. We know it's coming from God, but physically we don't know how it happens. So it is irrelevant what you earn, what your husband is saying you should give. Bless it. Do it joyfully. And even ask God, Father, now I have a thousand, I'm, I'm able to give 500. Help me get to 10,000, let me give 5,000. Help me get to 20, let me give 10. L let that be your prayer and your focus. These conversations, and he's doing this, and so we are suddenly about to conclude he's a wicked man, he's not caring that I cannot buy a dress. That's the, the conversation the devil wants us to have. Because if you use your mind and your mouth and your thoughts to do that, you always keep earning what you're earning now and be earning the little and be concerned about protecting the little. But if I will let the Holy Spirit help me to see like God that, God is a God of abundance. He will never ask you to give more than what he's about to bless you with. So the, the, the mindset has to be, I am given even more than I think I can give. God help me receive more so that I can give more. Giving is a training ground for most of us because most of the time we have a mindset of if I give, if I have enough, I will give. It's not true. If I have little and I can't give when I have more, I won't give. It is, I mean, most of, in my experience in life, the people that have blessed me the most are not the ones who have the most. It's the truth. They are not the ones who have the most. So the mindset of this is my money. Let me protect what I can buy for myself. It is not a good mindset. It is the mindset of limitation 
It is a mindset of scarcity. The mindset of abundance is I'm going to give what I have and even more than what I have. And if I am struggling to do that for my family, sweet sis, it is a problem. Because as a mother, who cares if you are giving a hundred percent of what you have to your family, if God is your father? So because God doesn't like Sister Mona was saying, we are not mothers to only our children. We are mother, we, we are mothers to nations. We are mothers to, you know, what is it called? Continents, to worlds. And so it, there has, the, the, it cannot be that I have a limitation on what I give. Yeah. Most people that I experience, they give more than they have. I don't know how they do it. I have people, and some of them are on this platform, that are helping me with projects where they, they, they need to pray to God to give them transportation to get there. They do it and keep doing it and keep doing it. So it's not even about their own family or what do they have and what can they get. And it's about God enables us to give. God enables us to sacrifice. So when it comes to money, every time I feel like thinking about, oh, what about me? It's a very bad thought. It's not a good thought. It's a thought of scarcity. It's a trap from the devil. The thought that I should have is how can I give? And so if I have that heart, that willingness, that desire to give, I have seen God open <laughs> the floodgates of heaven. And so that's the reason why I, I really like, I don't even know why, you know, I think it was because we we're talking about the child that sister um, Mona was talking about Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa had nothing. I mean, read about the people that give the most. They have nothing. They have absolutely nothing. And yet because of their hearts, because of their desire, because of the willingness, they are able to bless millions and millions. I experienced somebody recently that is feeding 30,000 people every month in South Africa. 30,000. When I hear the figure, my mind blows in my head. 30,000. And yet, I was you know, on the streets of London with her and she was buying shorts for her son. And she was buying the cheapest possible brand. That, you know, it's like, she doesn't have the mindset of this is my son. I have to buy a designer brand for my son and, you know, and make sure my son is, you know, she uses what God has given her to feed people. When it comes to her family, the Lord has taught her to, you know, to be careful. What are we buying? What are we spending? It's not because she doesn't have, but she thinks about the, the, the other people that the Lord has made her see. And I, I have videos of this soup kitchen that they are running. It is unbelievable that one human being from one person's kitchen, a thousand people have fed. You can't have that mindset as a Christian that, oh, well, they say I should give this. I mean, give, even when your husband says give 50%, give 100%. Sweetheart, and open your, you know, open your channels to receive. The channels that we give through, God multiplies. So if I give through one channel, oh, it's only 50, and let me keep the others. That's, that's, that's you. You, 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 are, you are suppressing your own receiving channels. That's the truth. And so the Lord always trains us at home. That's what I have learned. The Lord will train you through your husband. The Lord will teach you to open your arms through the man that he gave you as your husband. And so if your husband keeps, it feels as if he's squeezing things through you. There is a training going there. There is a ministry coming out. There is something that the Lord is trying to polish there. Allow your husband to be used to bless you. Because when I hear this, I don't know what your salary is. I don't know what is going on in the house. I don't know how your family's economy is. But all I can hear is let your channels open. And the channels will not open when I am feeling pain, when I'm even giving into my own family. It means that even my own family's channels, I am squeezing it. Much more what God wants to do. All of us here, God wants to use us for big things. One person can feed 30,000 people. Most of us here, God wants us to feed 100,000 people. But we are so concerned about my own little money, my own challenges, my own problems. It is difficult to see beyond what God wants us, beyond what is going on in my own life. And so it is always a training, ministry, a training ground in the house. All the things that the Lord is going to use me to do, my training, a lot of it came from my home. And interestingly, my husband was one of the trainers that the Lord will use to train me. So sweet says, I don't think your husband is mean. I don't think that, I don't know who even came up with the models. There are people that are in situations where one person is not earning anything. So it's a hundred zero. 
that one too, what should they do? There are also people that they are even earning more and the other person is earning very little. And the little that the other person is earning don't even bring one kobo. There are also people where the one earning more is bringing 1% and the one earning less is bringing 100%. It is irrelevant if one person will apply the principles in the word of God. And the Bible is very clear about the word give. It will come back to you. So don't, don't care about the people around you, what they are doing. Care about what is God asking me to do. And let it be with joy that you give what you have. Because that's how God deals with you. He deals with you first as an individual. And he has good plans for you and your own economy and your channels of giving, but your channels of receiving as well. So we cannot dig into, okay, is it fair? Is it not fair? It, life is not about what is fair or not. It's about what the word of God is and what God's plan for you is. You are going to be a Mother Teresa. Sweetheart, focus on how God is going to expand your channels and leave, leave, leave the other person and be grateful that he's, he's, he's being used to push you to change your mindset when it comes to the economy in the house. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> God bless you. God bless you. I think you have thoroughly covered, completely covered that every aspect of that. Um, of those those two questions. God bless you so much, sis. Okay, let's press ahead because we have a few questions. We have a um, how many more? One, two, three more questions to get through. Okay. Um, this one is long. Okay, let me try and summarize this next question, please. So there's this this lady, this sister got married at the age of 23. Her husband at the time was 35. So there's a 12 year um, age difference. She had just finished school, didn't know what marriage entails. She didn't know anything about marriage. Uh, she was naive and she thought he was nice um, and assumed he was the right person for her. She says she didn't have anyone to talk to. He also didn't give her some time to think um, you know, basically, essentially, she feels she was rushed into this marriage. Now, two years down the line, and now obviously now she's 25 and he must be 37. She says everything about him has changed. His character, his lifestyle, his attitude and habits, which includes infidelity with multiple partners, deceit, are all starting to be unveiled. And she's now just realizing the kind of man he is. And now as she's re reading books and getting more education and enlightenment, on marriage, she's realizing he's not the kind of person that he she wants to spend her life with. And she wants a divorce or separation and is asking how to go about it. Is the question clear, please? Is the question clear? Should I repeat the facts, please? Sis, oh. I think the question is clear. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pastor Line is actually here with us. I think she hey, was. Pastor Line here. Oh, please, let yes, Pastor Line she, answer this. She was, she unmuted earlier when um, we were talking about the finance question, but you were faster. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I, I was actually enjoying the sharing. So, I, I wanted us to go on. Thank you so much, dear sisters, Sister Mona, Sister Ibua, Sister Koridi, all sisters who've shared so far. Thank you so much. It's been a blessing. Yeah, so this question, um, so the lady is saying that she married early. She wasn't sure about the husband. She wanted somebody to advise her. She didn't get advice. She got married, and now she wants advice on separation and divorce. Sweet says, what we want to tell you is that, you know, usually you don't need advice to disobey God or to go your way or to do what you want. But if you want advice to work in alignment to the Lord, that's what we do. What we want to do is to encourage people to obey God, because anytime you walk in a way that is, you know, contrary to what your father wants, it, it comes with problems. And usually if somebody should ask us that, you know, can you advise me to go my, you know, like go my own way or to leave my home or whatever? What I suspect is that the person is actually asking me something else. The person is asking me, 
that she wants help. She wants to get this right. She wants to do this right. Because to leave your house, you really don't need advice. Yeah, so what I want to say to you is this, that I want you to just calm down. Everything that our sisters have spoken from the beginning, all the questions they were answering from the very first question, everything Sister Muna said, is actually able to answer your question. It's not really about us at all. It's not about how I feel, what I think, whether I was aware, I wasn't aware. None of us were aware, you know, when we were born into our families, none of us were aware. We didn't plan, we didn't know how family systems were. We came in and we came to find out. And sometimes you can get into marriage for whichever reason or not. I mean, most of us knew next to nothing. But this institution is put together by the almighty God. He loves us so deeply and he gives us the wisdom to walk it. So what we do is that we go back to him in prayer and we ask for wisdom. If you feel that you are feeling you are getting dry in your love, you are getting drained in your love, a new command I give to you that you love one another. It's a command from him. It is his love in us, himself in us, that he calls out of us to love him back and to love one another. And so these are the things I want to encourage you on. I want to say to you, that you are a good woman. The Bible says that he who finds you finds what is good and obtains favor from God. I want to encourage you that you walk with that thinking. The Lord has brought you here. This young man you met when you were 23, even then you were so young, probably naive, etc. But even then you loved him. You are able to honor him, respect him and love him. The Bible says, wives, he says, submit yourself to your own husband as you do to the Lord. Meaning that... The way I submit to my husband has a correlation with what I do with the Lord. And so when you begin to walk in alignment with the Lord, the Lord helps you to be able to overcome these feelings. I don't feel like I don't want to, da, 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 da. There are some things that the Lord expects of us. It's not always that we want to or always that we feel like, but we submit to him. Why? James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee. A lot of the things we go through is really Really the enemy trying to be, bring divisiveness amongst us. Now, the enemy cannot div divide us except he gets us to align with him to do the deal. He needs the human to get it done. So usually he tries to lie to us. He says, oh gosh, you know, you're not happy. You're not da, da, da. Go and get it done. Go and get it done. And then he causes us to take that step. So I just want to encourage you that you are able to do this. You are able to love the young man. You are able to be a blessing to your husband, your children, you know, and, and the world at large. I, I, I remember Sister Muna said, the fig tree doesn't eat its own figs. You know, it produces the fruit for others. You are able to be a blessing unto others. It's all about God and others. The Bible says, unto us, a child is born. The child was not born to Mary and Joseph alone. It was born unto us, unto us, a son is given. So there is something on the inside of you that the Lord wants to bring out so that you're a blessing to your family. So that's where you are now. And we want to encourage you. And all of us have been in those kind of places where our mindset, thoughts, Otherwise, we just wanted to do our own thing. But but there is a God thing. There is a God way. And I want to encourage you in that way. As we are speaking right now, may the Lord strengthen you. May the Lord comfort you. May the Lord counsel you. May he cause you to begin to desire to do things his way. To begin to desire to come into alignment with him. To come into alignment with the truth. If you are asking, I believe with all my heart that you are saying, Ladies, sisters, you guys, I just want to do the right thing. I just want to align. Please help me. The Bible says older women teach younger women how to love their husbands and children. It doesn't tell us to teach you to separate, to go away, to run away. It doesn't give us that. It doesn't authorize us for that kind of assignment. But it tells us to teach you how to love your husbands and children so that nobody maligns the word of God. That's what it tells us to do. And when we do this, some way, somehow, you get strengthened. People can quit on us. Some things can go real bad. But you know what? For you, Keep your focus on Jesus and continue to walk well. It is well, sweetie. You can do this. You and I can sit back a year from now, two years from now, and look back and say, wow, see what the Lord has done. What I thought I couldn't do, I have done. Why? Because we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Not by might, not by power. By strength shall no man prevail, but Christ 
gives her strength. And so what the marriage does is that it actually makes you holy before happy. It's actually, it's actually designed for our holiness before happiness. And sweetie, this is the time. This is the time. I mean, today I was just sitting there pondering the times and the seasons. I don't know when the final trumpet will sound. But when you and I stand before the great white throne, we have to understand that we are going to give an account of what we did with the life he gave us. And it better be good. Because when we get there, we say, oh, give the excuses. I didn't know. I did this. I wasn't sure. I had something, something. Judas says, Cairo betrayed me. So I couldn't go to the cross. Uh, Peter said, he did. Peter denied me. So I couldn't do what you said I should do. It won't fly. It won't fly. Okay, people may do whatever they want to do. But you know what, sweetie? You and I, we're going to just keep looking to Jesus and be like Jesus in this life. So that's what I want to tell you. I believe that my sisters will add more to it. But I pray that you have been encouraged. All right. God bless you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you, Pastor. Auntie Maud, your hand is up. Yes, please, ma'am. Go ahead. Good evening. Good evening, sister. Good evening. I want to add is that um as sister, you've been called to play a particular role in your marriage. Now you mentioned that you you were not really aware of what marriage entails. That's fine. But as you go on, you've got to learn, just as Pastor Adeline have said. Now the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. That in the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. So God made you the helper in your marriage. And who are you supposed to help? You are supposed to help your husband. I always tell people that, look, once you are made a helper, no matter what your husband is doing, you've got to help him. Now, imagine if you are at the beach and somebody is drowning. Will you stand there and be angry that the person is drowning? Why are you drowning? Didn't you see the, the, the vast ocean? Why did you go and swim? Is that what you are going to say when you see somebody drowning? What you will do instinctively is to call for help if you cannot swim to help the person. So in much the same way, you are in your marriage and your husband is drowning. The devil is taking him away. He's into all sorts of relationships. We shouldn't be because God expects the man to be a husband of one woman. And God does not um, um, agree to men having side chicks and all those things. So your husband is, is going away. Now, if Jesus should come today, he will lose it. He will not make it to heaven. And so why are you there as a helper? You are there to help him come out of this mess. And that should be something that should be on your heart. You should really go before God and cry for the soul of your husband. That is why you are there. He is going away. He is getting lost. And the fact that he is, he is having an affair with all manner of girls means that he's bringing all manner of things to the home. And you are there as the watchman and you should not let these things happen. So go before the Lord, cry on behalf of your husband, let the Lord step into your home and let there be peace and harmony. That is what God has called you to do. So don't say that you are going to leave him. You are going to leave him when he's in a mess. Then that means that you've not, you are not playing the role that God put you there to play. And as Pastor Adeline has said, when you go to God, he will, he will query you. I gave you a particular, you know, assignment. You did not do it. Now, whether you, you knew what marriage entailed or not, now you are in there. And so you've got to act it. You've got to play your role effectively. And God has not called you to play that role by your might. No. I always say that it's not by might, nor is it by power. By, by the Holy Spirit. Our help at the Holy Spirit is there. So please don't be helpless. Go to the Holy Spirit. He will help you. He's even eager. He's calling you, but maybe you cannot hear. I want to help you. Can you allow me to help you? Settle this thing in your marriage. So 
so that there will be peace in your marriage. And then your husband can also, you know, sit still and also play his role as the husband. The husband is supposed to love the wife. Now, when you help him, he'll be able to, to, to play this role effectively. So please, don't leave him when he's in the mess. Help him out. And this will help you to even grow into the full stature of Christ. At the end of the day, ultimately, we must all be like Jesus. And so God has allowed this to happen in your marriage so that when you start seeking his face, you will be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And you will transfer this to your husband. And then the two of you will come, you know, and, and, and live for God. So please, I'm begging you to, to, to you know, seek God's face so that everything will go well with your marriage. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Auntie Maud. Sister from Poma, you're up next, please. Sister Corey Day and please if we can just spend a minute to pray, pray sorry, pray for this sister. As Sister Maud shared, you know, I just felt a strong sense that we should pray in the spirit for just a minute to strengthen the sister wherever she is, it doesn't matter, but for her to receive the strength of the Lord to pay the price, to be able to play her role as a helper. So she would not watch her husband drown. Let's pray for her. Just a minute of praying the spirit. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, sisters, for praying. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Sister Corrida. God bless you, Sister Kumpoma. I, I, I felt that urge to pray for her as well, and I thought I would pray for her later, but, you know, this I think this was much better. God bless you for being that um, prompting. To stay for... Yes, please, um, go ahead. So, since I was I was reading the, the sister's um, question, and she said that I am reading books um, and getting enlightened. And I just feel led to share that um, sweet says, please stop reading any books. <laughs> there are so many things out there in this world. Some of them sound really nice um, and they are the wisdom of the world. Just focus on reading the Bible. Everything that you need to know about marriage is in the Bible. And also she said, I wanted to speak to somebody. And now you, you realize that you would have benefited from speaking to somebody before you got married. Now you are in the marriage, it's it's a fantastic idea to speak to somebody. There are sisters here that you can reach out to and speak to. So the Lord expects us to also learn along the way. And you said, oh, I've been married for two years and I don't know anything about marriage. Some have been married 20 years. We are still learning. We still don't think we know everything about marriage. Um, so you don't need to know everything about marriage before the Lord can help you. 
through the, the journey. In fact, it's a very beautiful journey. And I know that yours seems to have started with, you know, um, what you consider a struggle. But reach out as you have learned that it would have helped and benefited you to speak to somebody before you married. Again, it will help and benefit you to speak to somebody before you make any dramatic decisions. Anytime we feel the push, and I use the word push, the push to do something, you know, dramatic, urgent, quick, is never from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is very gentle. Even if the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to do something, it is felt in a different way. And it is never in misalignment with the word of God. So, oh, something is going on. I feel like I need a separation. I need a divorce. I need to get out. Sweetheart, the devil is pushing you. Stand. That's the word for you. Stand and seek help to stand. So the question, I want to reframe your question for you. How can I get help so that I can, you know, I can do what God wants me to do in my life? Not how can I get help to separate or divorce? Like Pastor Line said, we will categorically not help you <laughs> to separate or divorce. That's not our mandate. And God hasn't called any of us to do that. But you too, God hasn't called you to do that. God has called you to stand. And everything you need to stand, including what you need to read, including who you need to speak to, including how to navigate, like Sister Maud was telling you, including the prayers that you need, like what Sister Frimpoma um, just helped us to do for you right now. Everything that you need. It's available. It's actually available on this particular platform. So reach out and let us hold you and help you through the journey. You will stand. That's the word for you. How do I stand? Not how do I, you know, let the devil push me out. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Stefa. So a sister just shared a word for the the lady who asked this question, the one for whom we just prayed. And the Holy Spirit says that she's having an emotional affair, that she should stop it and stop listening to the wrong friends. And that's where she's getting this enlightenment, quote unquote, from. She's having, um, she should know um, that it will lead to death. He's not real. This person that she's in this emotional affair with is not real. So sis, I, I, I believe that you are on with us tonight, that you are listening as we are speaking and I if you have if you need help like everyone has said like Sister Fatu just said you there's so much help available to you right here. There are sisters who will walk with you along this journey. We will pray with you. We will point you in the right direction. You know send you to the different chapters or verses in the Bible that you need that you that will help you to stand that help you to to <laughs> to survive. I know I came to closer work as a complete mess and it was God who um, who led me here in the most random of manners that he led me to closer work wives. And he literally helped. It was, it was a lifeline for me at the time. So sis, please, um, whatever it is that you have been doing, whatever it is that has led you to this point, all the all, whatever the actions, all the steps you have taken that have led you to this place, please, it is very important that you cease and desist immediately. Reach out. Um, go back to the form that you filled. Give us your name and number. Or if you if you are you will have you definitely must be on one of the platforms. Reach out to any one of the admins. You know, somebody will help you. But don't feel like you have to do this alone. I don't feel like you have no choice. We all have choice. We all have choices, and it's up to you to make the right choice. There are so many, so many um, issues to be addressed. Yes, Sister has talked about the things that you're reading. You must understand that your body, your eyes, your ears, there are gates there. You have to protect what goes into your eyes, what goes into your ears. Not everything is permissible. Not everything is um, beneficial to you. So you cannot just consume anything that comes your way. So please, you know, you know when when the devil is trying to deceive you has to feed you with all kinds of things all over the place and before you know it you've been led completely astray so right now sis i'm begging you reach out reach out to me if you need to i'm on every one of the platforms reach out to any one of the admins if you need help but please um this uh, path that you're on uh, is less than ideal it will lead to death so please don't go this way 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Now we're going to take one last question because we've got nine minutes. And this one, I think, should help us. We should be able to manage this in nine minutes. Please, I need counseling on the reconciliation process and how to render a sincere apology. I want to assume <laughs> that she's the one trying to render the apology and she's the one trying to go about the reconciliation process in this situation. So stay for your hand up for this question or are you uh, are we still hanging on from the last one? But whichever way. Oh sorry, please. it was the last one. <laughs> feel free, feel oh, free, can... never mind. Yes, yes okay. Can. I can I can speak. Oh, sis. This one we 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 really love when the Holy Spirit convicts us. Yeah. Hey, did you mute yourself now? Sorry, did I mute myself? Yes, I was trying to put my hand down. <laughs> Sorry. I said we love this, we love this kind of question, sis. We also love the other one. But this one, I think because I don't know, we don't know what the reconciliation, what the issue is and how to yeah. reconcile. The answer is the Holy Spirit will help you, but please reach out. I would love to help her. Um Sister Corrigan would love to help you. But reach out and tell us what is going on. Um, even if you need us to be part of the conversation, we are happy to be there. Um, God will help us along the way. It's um, it's a beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit has convicted you. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know the with with the reconciliation process. Truly, you let the Holy Spirit lead. You know because there's so many things that are if it depend, and that's why it's hard to just speak generally. It's hard to just um to speak in a vacuum without really getting the contextual situation because there, there could be things that we could say, oh, go ahead and do this. But perhaps things have gone bad in that particular direction. And so this person will interpret that action as false or as, you know, won't receive it in the spirit in which it is being offered. So it, it really would help if, you know, you would you could provide more um, context such that um, we can actually help you along this process. It's, like she said, once the Holy Spirit has done the work of convicting your heart and guiding you, you know, bringing you to this point, then, you know, he's not going to leave you here. He's not going to let you get to the point, look, my sister, you need to apologize and, you know, you need to fix this and then leave you to figure it out on your own. He's ready to walk with you on each and every step and he guides you. If you need someone to walk with you along that journey to help you, Please, again, you have access. Please reach out. The, the form, again, is still there. Reach out. Give us your number and let us um, help in that situation as well. Um, Sister Viv just point, posted something, and I think she would like to give us some context on what she has posted. Sister Viv, over to you, please. Hi, sis. Good evening. Um, so Good evening. I think my voice is sounding better, actually. Good evening. Um, I can hear you. Yeah. Um, I've lost my voice um the last few days. Um, but I think um it's just about the reconciliation. Um and I think one thing so I posted that scripture because I think I've been really using that a lot. And Jesus was talking to the people about murder and he said, You 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 know, you guys are known, you know that when you murder, you face judgment. And I mean that's like the worst thing to do. Like you take someone's life, right? And he said, well, I'm telling you that when you get angry at someone, you face judgment as well. So basically, anger doesn't come far from murder. And I think when I heard that, I was like, boy, OK, here goes me, like, just letting go of everything. And um, I think it's been helping. And that scripture continues on to say that um, if you're coming to the altar and your brother has done something, Sorry, it muted. So it says, oops. Um, and then you remember that your brother has something against you. So more or less, like your brother is the one, like you're the obi, I don't know how to put it in it's obi town with me. You know, like it's not even per se, you've even done something. It could be that somebody just has an issue with you, right? You need to go and actually first be reconciled with that brother and then come back to God, like to the altar. So it doesn't even have to be, okay, they've offended you and then you're angry. 
it's even in a state where you might have offended them or you've probably not offended them and they have an issue with you, irrespective, you are called as a child of God and as a follower of Jesus Christ, actually go. And I'm not going to say something that I don't practice in my own life. And I think I've learned that a lot from this platform as well. But, um, and this is something personal to me, but I've always um, not had a good relationship with my father, right? And um, not because like I'm hating on him, but he's just not being present. So having grown up with that, um, I remember it, it, it's been a blessing because that's how I like to see things in everything. There's a blessing to it, right? To learn something, to bring God's glory to it. So before I got married, I would pray that my husband would be like, my, and my kids would have that relationship that I always wanted. And God has been so good with that. Like I say this to the glory of God. So um, in terms of even that struggle is turn around for my good because all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. But in talking about that, um, it, at one point in my life, this is when I was a teenager, if somebody asks me, oh, where's your dad? I'll just tell them he's dead. And I say that in my, like there was no pain no nothing in me it was just yeah he's dead because to me he was dead to me today I say it to the glory of God that I'm actually able to say I'm praying for him like I my soul yearns for his soul to be delivered to God and I think it comes to a place where it's between you and God it's not what the person has done to you or what you think they should have come to do to you like to say sorry or whatever it is remember what God expects of you and act accordingly. And um, you will see that you get to a point where you grow, you become mature. Um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> you become mature. And um, I love I loved, um, James 1, 2 to 4, and it says, my brothers and sisters, consider it pure joy when you go through trials and tribulations of many kinds, because it will test your faith, and the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And... Um, in the end, you become mature and you lack nothing. And to me, what I went through in my life with my father was a lot of trials and tribulations. But, you know, I persevered and I believed that God had a plan, you know, a bigger plan. And um, as at now, I'm able to say, Do you know what, it's matured me and it's grown me in different ways. So, you know, the, the I guess the worst part you can think of is who hurt you, right? How deep? Can the person be related to you if it's not a, a parent who gave birth to you? Do you get my point? And um, or even like a partner that you marry. Um, I think it starts from parents being so close to you. And if someone is able to say, Do you know what, I've let go of the hurt or whatever it is, and I'm able to actually ask God to have mercy upon their soul and to deliver them. I think you can get to that point where you can do that. And um, I always say this to the glory of God. I said, if anything, I'll still help him with my heart open and just, you know, just do what I need to do and help him, even if he needs my help. Um, so I hope this is encouraging. If you want to talk to somebody, um, as Mr. Corridor said, we're all here. And based on some people's life, life experiences and the word of God, we can always give you um, some good advice. But yeah, God bless you and thank you. God bless you, Sister Viv. Thank you so much. Thank you for braving the, the voice issues to speak and to, to encourage our sister. God bless you. And God bless everyone um, who has um contributed tonight, who has um answered, helped to answer these questions that we have brought. We did, we weren't able to get through all of them. We have one more, but we will take that into next week um, as we are mindful of our time. Uh, but I want to, I think we need to pray and thank the almighty God because it, it is so clear that his presence was strong with us here tonight and we couldn't have, we can't in any way possibly accomplish anything without him. His word tells us in any case that without him, we can do nothing, but he has, He's. he doesn't, you know, hold us to ransom as soon as we gather as soon as we call he's here he answers and he's present and he teaches and he guides and it's such a wonderful wonderful relationship so father we want to say thank you we want to 
exalt your name. We want to we've come, Father, to bless you, to praise you, to honor you for all that you do for us. We don't take it for granted because, you know, it's easy to, but we can't. You're, you're too awesome for that. We thank you for loving us the way that you love us, so for loving each of us individually as if we were just, we were each the only child that you have. But yet we have so many of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, mighty God, because you are wonderful. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for guiding us. Thank you for showing us the path in which we should walk. Thank you, Lord, for surrounding us with your love, for surrounding us with your favor. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to deal with this life alone. This life is challenging and you have blessed us with the Holy Spirit so that we don't have to deal with it by ourselves. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for sending Jesus to die and to do all of that stuff on the cross so that we could have a better covenant, to have a better relationship with you. And then he left and left the Holy Spirit with us. And you know, it's just awesome and we are, we are grateful. We thank you for all of our sisters who have brought questions, who have had burdens on their hearts that they have brought, that you have helped us to answer tonight. We ask Almighty God that you would minister, continue ministering to their hearts, that you would turn their hearts towards you, and they would seek you and only you. They won't seek any man. They won't seek any woman. They won't seek any traditionalist. They will seek only you, and you are the one who will guide them You, are, as, you have, as you are guiding us all. You will guide them also. You will lead all of us, oh Lord. You will keep us. Father, we are grateful. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your protection. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord, that they even brought those questions at all. They could have gone ahead and done all kinds of atrocities. But because they, you know, their hearts are still tender towards you, because you are drawing them, drawing all of us constantly towards yourself. They have brought those questions because they are still seeking you. Father, thank you. Thank you so much. We give you all praises tonight and give you all glory. All honor and adoration. We bless your name. Ah, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed with thanksgiving. Amen. All right, sisters, again, God bless you. Thank you for making the time. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Um, Sister Mavis, are you here? Are you ready? Can we hand over yes. to you? Yes, sister, awesome. I'm here. God bless all right, you. So we are, God bless you. So we sisters, we are praying. 10 10 to midnight i believe and then we'll be back again at three so if you're able to stay on and pray if you need to go and handle some things and come back and pray whichever way please as often as you are able to pray. all right shall we please share the grace as we close please unmute, please unmute. Yeah. and now may the grace of our lord, the grace of our lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Really God's goodness. 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 goodness and mercy. Amen. 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 Good evening, sisters. We bless God for how He loves us, how He's enabled us tonight to hear His word. I just want to read a scripture from Psalm 145, verse 9. It says that the Lord is good to all. The Lord is good to all, and His mercies never fail. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies never fail. So we want to bless the name of the Lord, sisters. Please join me. Let's pray in the language of the Spirit. Please join me. Let's blow in the in the language of the Spirit this evening. La baro shaya kaya da basun da bari in da bali. Iye ka baro shaya kada basun de bilililibi. Tora basun dibri adaba sanda mara rabusha nana nama 
Imakuya Dayanda Balika Pundi Brihenda Baladaba Arakala Boshanda Baroshanda Baladaba Arakandi Bri Akayasa Kayam Baladaba his mercies, they are new every morning. They are new every morning. The Lord is good to all. Baye kayanda bale be 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 be. We kati bre atara basin de be le 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 be. Rasha dala baso kapan de be le 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 be. We kandi bre andama sunda balada. In the name of Jesus, Father, we bless you. We bless you for your kindness. We bless you for your faithfulness. We bless you for your love. We bless you for your Holy Spirit who convicts us of wrong and sin. We thank you, Father. We thank you for all that you have enabled us to hear. Your voice that you speak to us. Thank you that tonight you have affirmed to us that you are our shepherd and we are your sheep, the sheep of your pasture. We give you glory, O oh Lord. We give you honor. Maseka libra arabasuba rabari ke mande mahala mahandi be eka do seka bayaba imakanda baroshe yekele andi breada zanda makose bera basi kandili akayanda barosha. Father, we bless you, O oh Lord. 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 Abaye karama ne merianda. Thank you, O Lord, for the lives of our sisters, O Lord. Thank you for your direction. Thank you for your instructions, O Lord. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for granting utterance. In Amalo Sarianda Seke Lebranda Bararadaba. And the Bakusha and the Zeka Palibre Ebalusha. A Kemandu Zeka Mandu Dudubo Sukebre Handa Radaba. E Baya Mananana Moshun Dididididi. E Balo Kushin Dididididi. Le Banda Maru Shayakayanda Bara Sanda Balaradaba. In the Baradaba. In Emilihanda Maradaba. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord for at his command they were created and he established them forever and ever. Raka and Shaya, he issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Ayenda maroshunda maroshanda bararabam. Ali branda maroshundilele ikayanda. Let us praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is exalted. Makikaroshindilele. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. And he has raised up for his people a horn, Marakanda Marosha, the praise of all his faithful servants of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. This is your blessing, the name of the Lord for tonight. You may not know the degree to which the Lord has brought deliverance through his word. Anytime the word of the Lord goes forth, there is deliverance and there is healing. Aranduro Shakayanda and Oboso Kabir Ebala Sanda Balalaba, Ekinda Boshundiri Handa Rabasha, Ayikayara Basu Kapanda Radabam. He sent out his word and healed them, and he rescued them from the grave. We de baro shanda bandi bre anda barada da busha. Andi bre enda makusu ke ble le le lebe. Ekuru su ke mende ri anda bara banda maraba. Ike anda bara. Father, we thank you for your words tonight. Ali kaya da balusha. Ike bre eba anda bala anda. Thank you, Father. Basu ke branda basike. Ebele bali bali kada bala bashunda. That these seeds are falling on 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 fertile soil, fertile land. Ya shere basu o o kianda. Nema na masindoro seke. Ika 